To the west of the Anderfels region in Dragon Age lies the Volca Sea, a location not frequently talked about in games, but one that may be hiding some of the most interesting secrets in the entire series. We know that until around the Black Age of the Chantry Calendar, the Ander city of Laesh was said to be trading with mysterious and unknown ships that came from across the Volca Sea. These concealed traders were rumored to don horrific masks hiding their faces, and they were affectionately given the name the Voshai by the people of the Anderfels. These Voshai had an extreme interest specifically in Lyrian, and traveled great distances to trade and obtain as much as possible. It was also said that all of these Voshai ships were captained specifically by dwarven-like people, with no reports of any elvish adjacent inhabitants ever being sighted. News of these people began to spread throughout the lands of Thetis, and even resulted in some large-scale Tevinter expeditions taking place, but each and every one of them disappeared as soon as they ventured into the Volca Sea, never to be seen again. Smaller bands of warriors and adventurers have also tried their hand at crossing the sea and discovering the lands of the Voshai, but all have failed. This has resulted in a lot of people around the sea beginning to think that it is in fact cursed, but that starts to make us ask the question, cursed by what? And even more so then, how are the Voshai making their way across? These questions have now gone unanswered for hundreds of years as the Voshai seemingly disappeared as quickly as they came, with no more of the mystery race coming to trade for some time. Well. That is until recently, where rumors have once again began to crop up and tell of the Voshai's return to the Anderfels, this time bearing tales of something unbelievable. Some reports have come out that the Voshai are screaming about some sort of massive cataclysm that has occurred, and that they're seeking refuge. But what exactly is this cataclysm going on? And does it tie in with the reason the Volca Sea is so hard to navigate in the first place? Could it have something to do with the lyrium that the Voshai came to buy when they first crossed over? After all, we know lyrium in Dragon Age has very magical properties that originate from the Titans themselves. And if these Voshai are very dwarf-like as they have been described, could they in fact be descendants of the original dwarves that inhabited Thetis before the fall of the Titans, when it was said that both of them were combined. If any of this is true, it could hold the keys to unlocking some of the biggest mysteries of the ancient lore in Dragon Age, and also would give us a great idea of what life was like outside of Thetis itself, potentially telling us about a bigger threat than we have ever seen, causing cataclysm everywhere on the planet. It's a story we'll likely never know the full backstory behind, but one I would love to have even a small amount of updates on in future games. In the world of Dragon Age, each race and civilization worships their own gods and deities, with their own rich history and lore, and also all with their very own splinter factions and groups. For the humans, these main higher ones are the Maker and the Old Gods, and for the elves, it's the ancient pantheon of the Evanurus along with the Forgotten Ones. But what if the Old Gods and the Evanurus weren't actually all that different? You see, we already know that Solus or Fen'Harel doomed the ancient elven by creating the veil and removing their fade magic from the material realm. And it was only after this that humankind first made landfall on the continent of Thetis, bringing with them the traditions of the Maker Old Gods and the first established capital of Tevinter. And from those traditions, we also know that the seven magistrates of Tevinter doomed us all by committing the second sin and traveling into the fade, which resulted in the blight coming forth from their realm into our own. But what if this was all planned, and not by the old gods of human tradition, but by the ancient Evanuris of the Elves? Listen to this line of dialogue from Dragon Age Inquisition. Solas, the dragon Corypheus commands, could it truly be an archdemon? One assumes that if it were, we would be facing a blight. So what is it then? A corrupted dragon? Simply another darkspawn? It is connected to Corypheus. Such a relation goes beyond mere control. It is a bond. It makes you wonder if that's all the Archdemons themselves are, pets to beings who no longer exist. I would not go as far as that. This dragon is a replica, spawned from a creature who aspires to greatness. No more. Could it be that the old gods, or dragons and Archdemons, are actually puppets for the Evernurus? What if after Solus trapped the Evernurus behind the veil, he also knew they would likely try to escape at one point? Maybe the old gods from humanity's traditions are nothing more than the Evernurus disguising themselves as dragons in order to gain our favor. That would explain the blight as well, because Solus being the cunning individual he is would have anticipated something like this, 
So when humanity tried to free the Evanuris from their prison, thinking they were talking to the Maker and Old Gods, Solus had also hidden the Blight in the Fade, thus releasing it onto humanity and forcing them to fight and kill the Archdemons, which would in turn kill the Evanuris' power. This theory gets a lot more interesting too when we realize that there are seven Old Gods in human tradition, but also seven Evanuris in the Elven Pantheon when we take away Fen Harel and Mithal, who were both said to not be like the others. So maybe the gods of humanity's beginnings in Dragon Age are nothing more than the ancient elven warriors and deities that are speaking to us from beyond the Fade in an attempt to get another race to free them from the prison that Solus has damned them to. It's an awesome theory for sure, and if true, shows that the elves really are pulling the strings behind everything happening in Thetis. And while I understand why so many Dragon Age fans find elven lore to be too all-encompassing, I love the idea of something like this and how it could tie the entire world and all gods together into one much more explainable thing. Liliana is one of a handful of characters we see in every single Dragon Age game, but what makes her especially interesting is that she also is one we can kill in the first game, Dragon Age Origins. The reason this is so peculiar though is because regardless of whether we actually kill her or not, she always shows up in the next two games. And in Dragon Age Inquisition specifically, we'll even remark how she is not sure how she came back to life if you did indeed kill her in the first game. While this is most likely a retcon by Bioware to bring back a character into the main story that players could have killed early on, the in-lore explanation is a lot more intriguing. You see, what a lot of players don't know is that at the end of the Dragon Age Inquisition Trespasser DLC, the following ending credits can be seen if Leliana never became divine. Eventually, Leliana became distant and contemplative, often secluding herself in the rookery with none but her ravens for company. One morning, the residents of Skyhold awoke to a great beating of wings and a vast cloud of ravens blotting out the sky above the fortress. Those who investigated found both the rookery and Leliana's chambers vacant, with only a single message left as explanation. The lyrium sank thought into being. Now time is tale, and the melody is called elsewhere. Until I am needed, I am free. Something really strange is going on here. This last message left by Leliana seems to imply that she might be some sort of lyrium mind monster, and would explain how she was able to simply vanish without a trace and the theory only gets crazier from here too. If we go back to Dragon Age Origins where it all started, some may remember the quest called In Hushed Whispers, where if Leliana has not been killed yet by the player, we can learn a story about how she was tortured and experimented on due to her extreme resistance to Red Lyrium and Blight. We can read passages in this section that talk about how the scientists of the time were fascinated with her immense abilities and could not figure out what was going on with her. Furthermore, in the Leliana Song DLC, at one point, Leliana starts to hear voices in her head, after surviving a wound that should have killed her, instead releasing a flurry of talking heads that tell her, fight for those who can't, something a sleeper agent would be told. And finally, in the World of Thetis Volume 2 lore book collection, we can find this entry. In Leliana's most vivid memory of her early childhood, she sees herself, a child of little more than four, holding her mother's hand as they stand on the stone terrace of an Orlesian villa, looking out at the cresting waves of the waking sea. Behind them are gardens of sweet orange and lavender, but the only fragrance that stands out to Leliana is the gentle scent of her mother's grey linen dress. These days, Leliana is unsure if the moment is real or merely imagined, but cherishes it nonetheless as it were one of the few images she retains of her Ferelden mother. Could it be that the reason that Liliana is so resistant to Lyrium, the reason she seemingly comes back to life after dying, and the reason she has such a hazy memory of her past is because she's actually a mindless husk controlled by Lyrium, simply set forth into the world to accomplish the task of someone else as a puppet. Liliana was never actually born. She simply is a mindless body that has been infused with fake memories from Lyrium. It perfectly explains all the oddities with the character, and may mean that Titans or some other force are using her for something we aren't aware of yet. And considering she's part of the highest ranks of the Inquisition at the time when we play, would have access to the most top secret information available, and that may just come back to bite us in future games. There are many strange and ominous locations in the world of Dragon Age, whether it be the Fade separated from the real world by the Veil, or the Deep Road separated from land by thousands of miles of rock. But one place that many players might not know about is the Void. 
Said to be a location empty and devoid of life, the void stretches on for eternity in all directions and consumes all. And most scary, no one knows how to get there. Multiple different cultures and people have thoughts about what the void really is, with the Chantry and Chant of Light arguing that the void is somewhere between empty spaces in the Fade, and the Elvish teachings arguing that unimaginably deep underground, you can follow the deep roads far enough until you reach it. This has made some in the community begin to speculate that the void is actually a piece of space-time between the planet we inhabit, and that either by ascending into the heavens of the Fade in the sky, or descending into the hellish darkspawn-ridden deep roads, one can find it meaning the world of Thetis is actually positioned on a sort of loop. And in all of the prominent teachings and religions of Thetis, we hear one thing in common, that in the void lies our eternity. Here lies the abyss, the well of all souls. From these emerald waters doth life begin anew. Come to me, child and I shall embrace you. In my arms lies eternity." These are the words of Andraste in some of her writings, and it seems to imply that the Void plays some sort of significance in Thetis we aren't yet aware of. On top of all of this, we also have some small lore entries in game that mention short-lived Neverin cults that predated the Chantry called the Empty Ones, that supposedly worshipped the Blight itself, and thus the Darkspawn. They exclaimed that from the words of an all-knowing being, they had learned the truth of the world, that the Blight originates from the Void itself, and that the suffering it brings is actually our salvation into eternity. Going off of this idea, some prominent theories online actually argue that the Void may be the equivalent of the Fade, but with blood magic, not their traditional forms using Lyrium. As we know, Lyrium is a substance that helps mages and Thetis draw power from the Fade to commit great feats like healing wounds, levitating objects, and releasing fire from their hands. Maybe blood magic is a similar idea, where blood is the source from which blight magic can be pulled from the Void. Could this mean that the Void is actually the antithesis to the Fade? Maybe the Fade and cause for so much concern in Thetis is only part of the issue, a sort of heaven and hell analogy. But either way, it's hard to say, because the Void to this day is one of the least well understood places or even objects in the Dragon Age universe, and there are so many ways the lore could go with this one. In Dragon Age Origins, there's a book titled From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons that many people may have missed, and in this novel we find the following passage. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible. Always far off, for it seems that the only one rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black. The Black City, previously known as the Golden City, is another massive point of interest in the Dragon Age lore, and for good reason. In the Chantry's teachings, we are led to believe that the Maker originally created the Fade as the first realm of existence, and in this Fade lies a golden and magnificent city, with the Maker at its throne. Whomever was at the seat was the ruler or the gods themselves. But when the Seven Tevinter Magisters teleported themselves into the Fade in physical form, the sin was forever remembered, and the golden city turned black, and the blight was released upon the world. Recently though, Bioware released a new cinematic trailer for Dragon Age 4, and in it, may have just spun this entire theory and folktale on its head. You see, in this cinematic trailer, there's a short shot of Solus and the Golden City, and the events that took place when Solus imprisoned the Evanurus and the Fade. But wait, something weird happens in this sequence, because as the narrator is remarking about the event, at that exact moment we see the Golden City turn black. In his final fight with the Elven Gods, Solus imprisoned them, and created a veil that split our world from the raw magic of the Fade. Could this be implying that the story we have been told by the Chantry is wrong? Maybe the Golden City was not the seat of the Maker, but rather the Evanuris, and when the veil was cast upon the Fade, with that too, the Golden City was decimated. This would perfectly explain why in Chantry lore, those seven Magisters saw nothing when they arrived at the Golden City, because it was not the Golden City at all, 
Rather, it had already become the Black City, and from its roots the blight was spreading, the same one that the Magisters brought back with them. If true, this would have extremely far-reaching and massive ramifications for the ancient lore of Dragon Age, and would even tie into the theory that the old gods of Tevinter themselves are the Evanuris, and that humanity has been tricked into following the same gods as the ancient Elven. Either way, it seems clear that Dragon Age 4 Dreadwolf is going to bring us some more answers, and I can't wait to finally learn about this pivotal moment in Dragon Age history. And if you are watching this video far into the future after the game's released, hopefully it did turn out as awesome as this lore implies it could. Sindal might be one of the most lovable characters in the entire Dragon Age series. He originally started out as a sort of joke from the Bioware team, but has grown into something much much more. But the craziest part is just how sinister this happy-go-lucky kid may really be behind that cherry smile. Back in Dragon Age Origins, a dwarf named Bodan Fedek was searching deep underground in the Attican Taig for treasure when he stumbled upon a very peculiar room, and even more horrifying, a small boy standing aimlessly in the middle, sporting hair pale like marble and clear blue eyes that pierced your soul. In this room were giant marble and gold statues, and strangely, pictures and drawings of ancient and mythical monsters that have never been seen before in lore. Some of them were elven and other depictions of dwarven paragons, which are powerful and mighty ancient dwarves. Bodan ended up taking in the boy as his own and named him Sandal. He was very shy, awkward, and his diction was very unusual. And as time went on, more and more oddities began to crop up. For one, Sandal was very adept with magic, as we can see him encase a darkspawn using a rune in Dragon Age 2. But this is especially weird since dwarves usually have no affinity for magic. And this is why many in the community actually think Sandal is actually only half dwarf, with the other half being elven or even a mage. This is further supported by the note in game titled Gates of Segrumar, which reads, I only wish it had not cost you, my only child. I could not build the locked barriers that would carve the marks and break the sigil. You alone could save us, but only by destroying yourself. And I let you do it. Forgive me. Could it be that this note is from a mage in the Deep Roads that has had to abandon his child Sandal, and this is why Bodan found Sandal standing in that strange room? Other theories posit that this note could actually be from a Titan, and that Sandal himself could in fact be part Titan, or at least a vessel to carry their will, from deep within the Deep Roads, walking all of his way to the surface. Things only get weirder too when we account for the fact that Sandal can apparently see the future too, as we know from some of his dialogue in game discussions about the future of Thetis and the prophecy he's seen. One day the magic will come back. All of it. Everyone will be just like they were. The shadows will part and the skies will open wide. When he rises, everyone will see. So was Sundal in fact some sort of fortune teller? And if he is, where did he get these powers? Theories range from the Titans themselves to nothing more than a lyrium overdose, which would also explain why Sundal acts the way he does. But even more demented, some in the community have begun to speculate that Sundal is in fact one of the old gods themselves, potentially one that has been slain as an archdemon in a previous blight, and he has come back to wreak havoc. This is also supported by the fact that many people who Sundal hangs around with see misfortune come their way and would also explain the extensive magic powers he has that seemingly come from nowhere. In fact, this might even explain why a random child was found in a darkspawn infested zone deep, deep underground, all alone, somehow alive, surrounded by ancient artifacts the likes of which we've never seen. Whether or not Sandal is actually a demon, an old god, or some sort of malevolent force though, none of that matters when you have a smile like this. The Dwarven Society in Dragon Age has some of the most fascinating lore entries in the entire series, and the story of their previous and sprawling capital, Kal Sharak, is one of them. Thousands of years ago, on the continent of Thetis, the modern conception of the Dwarven people lived in their heyday. They had multiple underground taigs or settlements, and built many massive structures and roads underground. And the most impressive of these at the time was the capital called Kal Sharak. It was during this time as well that the dwarves first came into contact with the newest inhabitants of Thetis, who had recently founded the Tevinter Imperium and were looking for an ally in their war against the elves on land. 
To aid in this battle, the dwarves at Kal Shirok made a treaty with the humans that lasted for years, and it was so strong that Kal Shirok was even known to attack other tigs or tribes of dwarves if they ever sheltered elves from war as they were the humans' adversaries. But over time, the Tevinter Imperium started to grow more and more annoyed at the fact that Kal Shirok was so close to their capital, and demanded that the dwarves move their base of operations to Orzammar to the west, and the dwarves conceded and agreed. At the time, there were four great tigs in the Dwarven Kingdom, but none except for Orzammar had an entrance to the surface world, and so now with the capital being moved there as well, it became highly relied upon by all great tigs across Thetis. This became a huge issue though when the first blight finally began, because in order to protect themselves, Orzammar caused a massive collapse of all of the deep roads leading to the other major cities, or Great Tigs, and this included Kal Shirok. And just like that, the people of that Great Tig were doomed to oblivion and death at the hands of the Darkspawn, or so the Dwarven people thought. Because over a thousand years later, signs started to crop up that maybe the long lost and forgotten city of Kal Shirok was still alive and kicking. Dwarven traders on the surface started to appear that had language patterns more similar to the ancient dwarves, not the modern ones most humans on Thetis knew, and in no time it became clear that these dwarves were in fact from the ancient dwarven capital. We see more proof of this too in Dragon Age Inquisition, where we can receive a mysterious note asking for the Inquisition's help, and if we abide by the note's stipulations while also playing as a dwarven main character, we get this note back. You follow instructions well. Respect of our territory is a first step and better than we expect from a child of the sods in the capital. We aren't kin, but there may be trade. We shall see. But knowing that the dwarves of Kal Shirok did in fact survive over a millennia of war with the Darkspawn and cut off from the surface world gives us more questions than answers. First of all, how has this city been kept such a big secret for so long? Well, in Dragon Age Inquisition as well, we can learn about how different Kal Shirok Dwarven traders had in fact been making contact with the surface world for many hundreds of years, but they wore masks and kept their identity and customs a complete secret, focusing on nothing but trading and then leaving without a trace. The question then becomes why so much secrecy though? Why not make their presence more known? And what did they have to hide? Well, here comes the horrifying part. Because the bigger puzzle in all of this is how did these dwarves survive for so long deep underground in a city thought gone against the Darkspawn, the greatest threat the world has ever seen? Well, we may just get our answer from a trader on the surface who wrote about an experience he had meeting a dwarf trader that hailed from Kal Shirok, and what he wrote has led to nightmares in the minds of many Dragon Age players since. As curious as I was, there was an undercurrent I found unsettling. I must stress that he and his helpers were professionals and honest throughout, but there was something I can't describe. While he remained hooded the entire time, he looked me square in the eyes when our deal was struck, unashamed. I lived through a time of blight. I felt the gaze of a Grey Warden and seen the corruption of his prey. Why I remembered both in that moment, I still can't explain. Could it be that the dwarves of Kal Shirok are blighted? But if they are, how have they not become like the Darkspawn? Have they somehow figured out how to overcome the taint and the whisper of the song that leads Darkspawn to their bloodshed? The Dwarves of Kal Shirok might be holding the answer to how to fight back against one of the most evil forces in all of Thetis, and considering their capital is in the Tevinter Imperium, where Dragon Age 4 will likely take place, sounds like a good as time as ever to figure that out. To me though, the most interesting part of this whole tale is just how a massive society of doors managed to survive on their own and shrouded in such secrecy for so long, and how their culture and customs evolved with it, while also hiding some of the biggest secrets in the whole series that hopefully we get to explore one day. When you think of scary enemies in Dragon Age, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably Emile de la Sette. Jesus, he's ugly. But besides that, most of you were probably thinking of the Darkspawn or Demons, some of the most ferocious creatures in all of Thetis that have caused big issues in each game. However, a much less common enemy may be present that most players aren't aware of, that of vampires amongst our myths. In a codex entry from Dragon Age Origins called Demonic Possession, we can learn the following. Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims they are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning from them and jealous of those creations he considered superior. They stare across the veil of the living and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it. They desire life, 
They pull the living across the veil when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world to possess it outright. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common of demons are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against the living. They expand their energies quickly, the most powerful of them exhibiting strength and occasionally the ability to generate life. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host, they become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead, they feed upon the living. Theirs are the power of draining both of life force and mana. So it's clear then that vampires, or at least a demonic version of them, do in fact live in Thetis, but are seldom actually seen for reasons unbeknownst to us. Also, for anyone interested, the next tiers of demons are Sloth, Desire, and finally Pride, whom are the fiercest of all, with it being said that a greater Pride demon, if brought back across the veil, could threaten the entire world.